They called it the Everest of rivers. Like Everest, it remained one of the last great fests of exploration. Then came 70 men with an unlikely armada of little boats. The Blue Nile rises in the mountainous heart of Ethiopia. It emerges from Lake Tana, 9,000 feet above sea level, and rushes for 500 miles towards the Sudan border through a gorge that is sometimes a mile deep. For most of its course, the river bounds over cataracts and rapids. The course of the Blue Nile is impossible to follow on foot. The sides of the gorge are too steep, and no one had ever survived a journey by water along the whole route until a British expedition arrived at Debra Marcos, close to the source below Lake Tana. The Blue Nile couldn't have been attacked without the full support of the Ethiopian government. Ethiopia is a wild, partly untamed country where you need all the help you can get. The expedition was led by the British Army, who flew a beaver aircraft all the way from England to do the reconnaissance work and to drop supplies. If it was to have any chance of success, the expedition had to be planned from the start as a precise military operation. The first complication was that they'd arrived in the middle of a minor civil war. So the base camp needed to be organized for defense if necessary. The leader of the expedition, Major John Blashford Snell of the Royal Engineers, had to mark out his defense plans on the top of a packing case. The team was by no means all army. The Navy was there, together with zoologists, geologists, and map makers. No scientists had ever managed to penetrate the Blue Nile Gorge before. The army's job was to get them in and out safely. Safety depended almost entirely on the boats chosen for the task. Jim Masters, another engineer officer, was in charge of the boats for the first phase of the assault. Assault was the right word. These were standard aluminium army assault boats, but they'd been specially modified to face the terrible Blue Nile cataracts after trials with models in laboratory tanks. No tanks could hope to imitate the kind of waves the Blue Nile had in store for them. Everything was lashed double tight, including the dodges they hoped would keep out some of the water. Extra large valves had to be fitted to the rubber white water boats. This was to allow football bladders to be slipped inside. If a crocodile punctured the hull, they'd give reserve buoyancy. While all this was going on, a final aerial recce was made. The whole route had already been flown and photographed many times, but it was vital to find out daily how high the river was running. Soon after takeoff, they flew over the Tissisat Falls below Lake Tana. The expedition would have to find a way of getting at least the boats over these. Above the falls, the river splits up into a number of small channels. The problem of getting through these would be like threading your way through a maze while riding a runaway roller coaster. Lower down the river, the walls of the gorge close in rapidly. Rather like the Grand Canyon, the total Blue Nile chasm is 15 miles wide and a mile deep. The river that has carved all this runs at a terrifying speed in a narrow gorge at the bottom of it all. John Blashford Snell had chosen to lead his men down this suicidal water chute during the rainy season, when the river was highest. On the face of it, this seemed crazy. His reasoning, though, was that there would be less chance of having the bottom ripped out of the boats by rocks. Only at really low altitude could you begin to sense the power of the river. Ahead now lay Shafatak Bridge, where the first part of the attack on the Blue Nile was to begin. The expedition was to take on the easier half first, 
though on the Blue Nile, easy is a relative term. From Shafatek, halfway along the U-shaped gorge, the assault boats were to tackle the 280 miles to Seba. Later, the white water team would return to the source and face the really rough stuff. The assault boat's first stage was to take them through the dreaded Black Gorge, from which pessimists had told them they would never emerge. The walls that confine the river and speed the current up to ten knots are beginning to close in, even at Shafatak Bridge. When you get your first close look at the river, Blue Nile seems a strange name for these muddy waters. It was below the bridge that Blashford Snell, resplendent in his white pith helmet, led his men into the four heavily laden assault boats. Eight men climbed aboard each boat, and each boat was already carrying 500 pounds of gear. From now on, they had to rely on what they carried with them, what aircraft could drop to them, and the supplies that overland parties might succeed in bringing in to chosen stop-off points along the river's course. The 32-man boat party would have stood no chance if the rest of the expedition had not been prepared to brave unmapped territory, often full of hostile tribesmen, to meet them at set points along the river. Just beyond the calm water off the beach, they could see the Blue Nile waiting to seize them. Jim Masters and John Blashford Snell sailed in the flagship Kitchener. They immediately found that even a 40 horsepower outboard could make no headway against the current. At least once they got underway, they would be going with it. From the top of the bridge, the boats look pathetically small to deal with a river that has been described as the last unconquered hell. As they hit the current for the first time, all they felt was a sense of elation. At last, they were on their way. They were committed. It was like setting out on a fast and very bumpy toboggan run. There could be no stopping or turning back. were going to be of little use. No one had ever been here before to check them. There was nothing to do except sit back and let the river take them. pace of the river speeded up, Jim Masters and Blashford Snell in the flagship kept a constant lookout for rocks and snags. The helmsman would signal to the following boats that there was driftwood ahead. To foul a propeller in this current is to be in deadly danger. John Blashford Snell remembers how they felt as the pace began to hot up. From the air reconnaissance, of course, we knew we were now entering the Black Gorge, and I must say it was with some foreboding amongst all of us that we did so. There had been a great many rumours about this terrible place where the water was supposed to rush through at a tremendous speed and people were dashed to pieces, and indeed many previous expeditions had uh, suffered a terrible fate in this gorge. In fact, hysterical people only, I think, the night before we set out from Addis Ababa had tried to warn us off, and indeed had foretold our doom. When we reached the gorge, of course, it closed in around us, and we noticed the water beginning to boil. There was no wind, it was rather eerie, and there appeared to be no living thing on the black basalt rock that stood out starkly at the side of the water. It grew darker, and apart from the noise of the engines and the hiss of the water going past, it became almost claustrophobic. People in the boat, I seem to remember, grew noticeably silent because we all knew that there was no turning back. The engines just wouldn't carry us against the current. And so having started, while I came to the moon, we had to go on. The 
the first thing that went wrong was a piece of driftwood catching in one of the boat's propellers, and this immediately put a boat out of action. And we then experienced the tremendous pressure and power of this river, because straight away the boat was swept down, chased and pursued, rather like uh, a loose sheep by sheep dogs, and eventually brought safely into the bank. But again, this illustrated the problem that once your engine failed, you were completely at the mercy of the water. The first stopping place had been thoroughly wrecked from the Beaver aircraft. It was on a small beach close to the river Gouda, a Nile tributary and a sizable river in its own right. The boat crews quickly discovered one big snag about such beaches. The Nile rises and falls so fast, according to the amount of rain that's fallen in the mountains, that it's impossible to camp on the level ground close to the bank. A sudden rise in the river could have carried them off in their sleep. It was easy enough to find a level place in which to cook and prepare the fairly monotonous rations but the only place for sleeping was always on a nasty slope. In these conditions, even a bit of tin cream cheese eaten on the tip of a penknife almost became a delicacy. It was as well that these were all carefully chosen men. The slightest friction in such conditions becomes difficult to handle. But the boat's crews got on well together and hopes were high. This stopping point, like the two that were to follow, had been chosen for some serious survey work. In this case, the zoologists wanted to study the crocodile population in these Blue Nile tributaries. One of the boats set off up the Goudin River. Here, the current was easier, and the boat could make good headway against it. Even so, the sheer power of the water was still quite frightening. On the banks of the Gouda, the expedition had a surprise. An Ethiopian water survey party had come in over land down the face of the gorge and set up a camp. It was almost the only friendly meeting the expedition was to have along the river's course. Twice later, once at night, they were ambushed and fired upon, probably because the tribesmen thought they were government tax collectors. On another occasion, one of their overland supply parties was held captive for several days. The Gouda produced nothing hostile, not even many crocodiles. Perhaps the water was too fierce. At this stopping point, John Blashford Snell led a party to examine one of the few bridges designed to cross this part of the Blue Nile. It's called the Italian Bridge, although the Italians never actually succeeded in finishing it. They got the stonework up all right, but twice when they tried to bring the metal span up from the Red Sea coast hundreds of miles away, the tribesmen stole it each time. The expedition now urgently needed fresh food. So the signalers cranked up the generator for the radio transmitter to call up the Beaver aircraft for a pinpoint supply drop. Meantime, Blashford Snell wrote his shopping list and soon deliveries were on the way. The first red supply chute dropped slap onto the beach from a thousand feet up. The next two came down through low cloud. They were only a few yards off target among the trees.
aerial delivery may be a splendid way to get your fresh fruit and groceries. But the parachute failed to break the fall of some of the containers sufficiently, so the pots and pans didn't arrive in very good shape. A panel beater's hammer is an essential part of every aerial shopper's kit. From the Gouda, they pushed on into an even rougher part of the Black Gorge. The cataract still lay ahead. They watched the rocks anxiously for tribesmen who were known to snipe just for the fun of it. But it was the rapidly worsening river that mainly concerned Jim Masters as the man in charge of the assault boats. Control on the river did prove to be quite difficult because there was a tremendous press of water, particularly through the very narrow gorges. Uh, this tended to make the current bounce off the walls of the gorges and set up whirlpools. The effect of being in a whirlpool, in fact, is uh, very similar to uh, when you're standing in a lift going down. You suddenly feel the bottom of the boat going away from underneath your feet. And it was most disconcerting to feel the water coming over the transom, the back of the boat, uh, uh, across the back of your legs. Now they were hitting hydraulic jumps, great standing waves six or eight feet high that rolled over and over at the tail of a cataract. the first one to be able to spot a cataract coming up. Now, these were usually caused by a sudden narrowing in the gorge and a geological fault in the bed of the river causing um, a dam effect. But way ahead, you could usually pick them up by a thin white line of water. And then as you got closer, of course, you began to hear the roar. I found these cataracts quite thrilling, to be, uh, to be honest, having been through the first one. Uh, and I got a, a, a twisted thrill out of uh, passing the word back to the people in my boat that there was another cataract coming up and, and, and noticing the excited stir that went around the boat. But it seemed as you approached the cataract that the, the boat ran slightly uphill and then at the top of the hill you could look down a brown water chute and at the bottom there was a V-shaped wave. Well, as you ran down this slope at quite a high speed, you would break through the V-shaped wave and go over the hydraulic jump, and then the waves would hit you from all directions. And it was here, of course, that we be began to get uh, almost swamped. through the first cataracts, though plenty more lay ahead. In all the excitement, it was sometimes difficult to remember that they were mainly here to get the first ever scientists into the Blue Nile Gorge. The next main stop was for their benefit. But where was the stopping place? According to the inaccurate maps, they were sometimes 2,000 feet up on a mountainside and not on the Blue Nile at all. So another of their tasks was to survey the river accurately. The commando-style landing with rifle at the ready was only partly for the benefit of hostile tribesmen. It was mainly as a precaution against crocodiles. No, 
Wildlife study was the object of this stop, and they seem to have chosen well. Clouds of butterflies covered the sandy shore. The butterflies went into the zoologist's nets. So did fish. No one had ever collected the animal life of the gorge before. No one had ever been in a position to try. Some specimens were a complete surprise, like the long-snouted electric fish that gave a 350-volt shock. Less of a shock was the catfish with barbed spines, which you find in the White Nile too. The same goes for the next one out of the bag a gaudily spotted Nile monitor lizard. This prehistoric looking creature was not known to exist so far up the Nile. Some leathery turtles went into the specimen collection. Others, equally unlucky, went into real turtle soup to vary the expedition's menu. Just for the record, this rubbery-shelled turtle's correct name is Trionyx, and he tastes delicious. The emerald-spotted owlet calmly posed for a picture after he flew into mist nets set at night to catch one of the zoologist's main studies, bats. They caught 23 different species. Some, like this orange leaf-nosed bat, were vividly coloured. Others were rare or little known. Two had never been found in Ethiopia before. The zoologists had only four days and nights in which to collect their specimens. Their only laboratory was a rough polythene shelter. They had to deal with a humid river climate that would decompose specimens quickly. Mounted bats and rodents were dried in the sun on cards hung between trees and tent. Often, the fiddling work of skinning and preparing specimens had to be done at night by glimmering torchlight. Spare time, which meant sleeping time, was spent filling up records. Once again, food was running low, so a second airdrop was called for. They now had their supplies for the last lap. An overland party had met them to take out the scientists' specimens. All that remained of the first part of the expedition was to run down to the final stop at Serba. The problem might be to find Serba. It was just a name on a very inadequate map. But the Blue Nile was by no means finished with them yet. The river always had a trick up its sleeve. Indeed, in the very last cataract uh, that we came to, the flagship struck a rock and was temporarily disabled. We came, as we reached the uh, Didessa junction with the Nile, to the country of the Shankila. A uh, people of, about whom we were a little worried because of the history of the troubles that other expeditions had had on the river. Indeed, the Franco-Swiss 1962 expedition had been ambushed not far from here, and that was the end of that. However, we need not have worried because these people now appeared friendly. The Shankilla reacted as though they were perfectly used to having 30 white men drop in to call. Several carried rifles, but these were ancient relics, probably left over from the Italian occupation, and quite unlikely to prove serviceable in defense of the village against rival tribesmen or even against a harmless scientific expedition. Roger Chapman did his best to impress the inhabitants with some simple white man's magic, straight out of Ryder Haggard.
But when it came to making fire, the Shang killer much preferred the tried and tested method of their forefathers by rubbing two sticks together. The expedition found that even if the bullet didn't fit, and even if the rifle it was intended for didn't actually fire, a round of 2-2 ammunition had more bargaining power than a whole sackful of trading beads. For half a dozen bullets, you could certainly have bought a goat to vary the monotonous expedition rations. But goats were out. For one thing, there weren't really the cooking facilities to deal with them. For another, the boats were already heavily loaded enough. The river was widening out fast. Now the problem was not rough water, but the risk that the boats might ground on a rock and overturn or rip their bottoms out. Just the same, a feeling of relaxation set in. After the cataracts, this was sheer holiday. Flashford Snell sent on one boat to look for their final destination. Later, they went ahead of us on a recce in one of our boats to find Serba, where we were to finish. Because, of course, from the maps, Serba was indefinitely marked, sometimes at one place and some on another. And we never really knew where it was. We'd only seen it from the air. And to find it from the river was not going to be easy. So this party went ahead, and the main group followed some two days behind. And we were very relieved when we saw their red smoke flare streaming out from the bank to indicate where they had found Serba. Indeed, it was a small missionary airstrip, some 500 yards of grass, about half a mile in from the river. And it was here that we were to be evacuated by our beaver and the United States helicopters back to civilization. In many ways, this was a sad occasion because, of course, it was the breaking up of the boat's teams who had traveled, worked, and lived together for almost a month while they voyaged over the 274 miles from the Great Bridge of Shafatak to this small place to serve. There was a great feeling of excitement, however, because we knew that this was not the end of the expedition, and indeed, ahead of us, there lay the most difficult section of all. We knew that from the upper reaches of the Blue Nile, from Bahadar, we were to face the area which no white man had seen in many parts, and also to meet, for the first time, the turbulent and terrible white water. So the aircraft flew in to pick up the men who were to face the fiercest test of all, the 200 miles of white water below the Blue Nile's source at Lake Tana. The whole team, plus their gear and assault boats, now had to be flown back to the original base camp from which they'd all started. The Beaver reconnaissance plane couldn't tackle this on its own. So the American army generously lent helicopters to the expedition. The assault boats were to be slung beneath them. Unfortunately, one was dropped accidentally in the riverside jungle and will probably never be found. Few tribesmen ever go into the bottom of the Blue Nile Gorge. So now it was back to the start at Deborah Marcos. The reason Blashford Snell chose to attack the white water below the source as the second part of the operation was that the rains had only just begun when they first set out. The Whitewater team needed the river as high as possible to get over the cataracts. At base camp, Roger Chapman told his team what they were up against. 
I think really one of our greatest problems is to decide what sort of kit we should take in these small three rubber boats that we had. You see, there were three of us in each boat. Now, the only way we could keep the stuff dry was to pack it uh, tightly into waterproof bags and then put them inside two thwarts, which we had in each boat. We'd put zips across, waterproof zips, in fact, across the top of the thwarts. And when we'd stuffed these full of kit, we closed the zip and blew them up with air, and thus everything was dry inside. Then everything had to be held secure. Everything, in fact, including our paddles, which were colored red, uh, green, and white, so we could distinguish them if we should capsize in one of the cataracts. Then, of course, we had our last-minute practices on the grass in case of capsize drill. Last-minute briefings and things of this nature were gone through in the greatest detail we could possibly think, because we weren't too sure what was ahead of us. We looked at maps and decided which route we would take various cataracts. Then, of course, came the problem of doing the drills. I must admit, we all felt rather stupid doing this on the grass um, out on main base camp at Deborah Marcus, but it had to be done. As you can see, that on the bottom of the boats, we'd put these straps uh, on about, and I think it was about a quarter of an inch thick of rubber underneath the boats for protection against the rocks. And here we had to practice trying to caps get the boats upright again after a capsize. And this really had to be a bit of a team effort. And the three members of the crew, once they'd been thrown into the water, as we knew we would expect, had to leap for the straps, pull it back on top of themselves, and then help each other back into the boat, and then find their paddles, and then carry on their way. And of course, here was the beauty of having the paddles tied in and having the paddles coloured, so you can tell which was your own. And of course, this we did quite a lot of times, and, and I'm pretty certain of it, when we did capsize, this helped us enormously to upright ourselves and carry on our way. Dawn broke on a sky full of storm cloud. There was going to be rain in the mountains on the day the team set out. They were to start at the source below Lake Tana. They'd be fighting white water for 150 miles to the Shafatak Bridge, where the assault boats had earlier started downstream. If they made it, the conquest of the Blue Nile would be complete. The rubber boats were called Faith, Hope and Charity. The team would need plenty of the first two qualities. Charity, perhaps, was what they hoped the river might show them. If so, they were in for a shock. The white water team was to take a pounding that left them shaken, half-drowned, and even at times temporarily demoralized. As they set out, there wasn't quite the light-hearted mood that had accompanied the earlier launching of the assault boats. Blashford Snell, who was to join the rubber boat group later, knew what Roger Chapman and his eight picked companions were up against. The aerial surveys had left little doubt about the power or extent of the white water. But no aerial photograph could convey what that force was going to be like actually battling the boiling current. The rubber red shank boats might look flimsy, but they'd been selected for the job after exhaustive tests. Their great advantage was that they were not only tough, but flexible, and would bend to the force of the cataracts where rigid boats would smash within seconds. Faith, hope and charity paddled out into a gentle current, and the nightmare ride down the white water was on. First, it wasn't a nightmare at all. It was more like a dreamy cruise down a wide summer river. treated them deceptively gently. 
Whitewater team man Alistair Newman felt nothing but exhilaration that first day. We went through a lot of minor falls, fairly easy stuff, and swamps, mangrove swamps, and where the river got very, very narrow indeed, perhaps 15 channels, two or three yards wide. We would take minor falls, perhaps six feet, without any preparation, just being able to see the water beyond, knowing it was clear, and go into them fairly blind. Of course, we had to clean the boats out, dry them out afterwards, but this was a matter of course after a couple of days. Sometimes we would drift into a second fall and have to take that too because we hadn't time to get into the bank. But most of the time we would spend bailing, taking the water out of the boats, giving ourselves the steerage to be able to keep going and try and row the boats with some hope of making way against the current. Soon they came to a fall which certainly wasn't a minor one. These were the great falls of Tissisak, as grand as anything on the entire 5,000 mile length of the Blue and White Niles put together. No one could hope to go down these in any kind of boat and survive. If the crews themselves couldn't attempt the Tissisat Falls, Roger Chapman had decided that the boats must go over in order to be able to say that the journey down the Blue Nile had been unbroken. So the Whitewater team hauled their red shanks ashore and portaged them round to the lip of one of the smaller branches of the falls. Tissisat maintains one of the few outposts of civilization in the whole length of the Blue Nile, a hydroelectric scheme. Just the same, there wasn't much of a reception committee to watch the white water team put their boats over the falls. The falls they'd chosen for the descent were barely 15 yards wide. But all the water that crashes over the many falls of Tissisat has to batter its way through this gap. One drawback they soon discovered here was that the rubber boats were an extremely heavy carry. For one thing, they were full of stores in watertight compartments, and their bottoms had been reinforced with heavy rubber to resist the rocks on the river bed. safeguard themselves while working on the slippery rocks, they set up a system of fixed ropes.
the youngest man in the team, got the dirty job of working in the drenching spray at the bottom. Although the team members were only a few yards away from each other, they had to use walkie-talkies because of the thunder of the waters. to the rim of the falls meant a perilous crossing by a shaky bridge made of slender tree trunks. As an engineer officer, Jim Masters, the oldest member of the Whitewater team, supervised the roping down of the boat. Miraculously, the red shank bobbed up undamaged at the bottom of the falls. Now the team let her drift down river to the next narrows where they could rejoin her. There, other team members were posted to catch her with a rope rigged across the river to stop her unmanned voyage. They carried on, often using a rope to get the boats down tricky stretches. Team member Chris Edwards recalls what it was like. Roping down some of the smaller chutes was successful. But again, there was, the hazard was a question of getting out of control and losing the rope, which would mean that we weren't ready to enter the cataract below us. Before we went into the cataracts, Roger always used to get us to come into the bank to try and observe a good route into the, into the white water ahead. Sometimes we could do this with success and uh, find a suitable entry into a cataract. Sometimes we couldn't. And obviously, the, the rougher the ride was when we were not sure of the best route into the cataract. I think the most terrifying thing of all, though, was the volume of noise and the fact that um, whenever a boat went into a cataract, though the, those of us behind would just see it disappear over the lip and it wouldn't reappear, and one would wonder what on earth had happened to them.
Edwards nearly drowned when he was held under time after time before a lifeline reached him. The most terrifying aspect of it was this frightful business of being continually dragged down into the bottom of the riverbed, being forced then by the water up to the surface, and then thinking that you're going to be all right, but suddenly the same force dragging you back down and tumbling you around and just spinning and turning and not having any control whatsoever over your limbs or movement and eventually beginning to realize that you were drowning then coming up to the surface once again thinking and looking around trying to see if anyone else was there being dragged down and going through the same process about three or four times and each time getting weaker and weaker and weaker and uh, believing that this was the end of the Blue Nile expedition as far as you were concerned. And then terrific relief, of course, when eventually the river did release you. Jim Masters had several narrow escapes too. Um, there were several emotions as uh, we saw cataracts ahead. Of course, the, uh, the big thing was a tremendous volume of noise. But there was, a, uh, there, were, there was always a very fast, smooth stretch of water leading up to a cataract. And in that time, you were absolutely petrified with fear. But of course, once you were in the cataract, you were far too busy trying to keep the boat straight uh, to give yourselves a chance. And then at the end of the cataract, there was always this tremendous feeling uh, of exhilaration. On one particular occasion, uh, we were uh, halfway down a cataract, when I heard one of my crew members at the front shout out, look out, we're going. And with almost no warning, uh, I found myself somewhere down on the bottom of the river. And it was like being shaken by a dog uh, or being in a, a tumble spin dryer. You had absolutely no idea which, which was up and which was down. Uh, I remember uh, on that occasion swimming like mad, but not really knowing whether I was coming to the top or not. They went on to complete the conquest of the Blue Nile. The river hit them time and time again. Some members of the white water team were so badly beaten up by the cataracts that they had to be evacuated and their places taken by reserves. Lower down the Nile, the river group supporting them was twice attacked by bandits. Tragically, the white water team lost one man by drowning when they were trying to take a safer route across a tributary. Was it all worth it? Men will always try to conquer the apparently unconquerable, whether it's a murderous river or a space trip to a far planet. The endeavor alone makes it all worthwhile. As with voyages in space, the gains went all in terms of pure adventure. The expedition had provided naturalists and geologists with unknown facts about one of the few unexplored parts of the world. By the time they got to the Safartec Bridge again, they had put the Blue Nile literally on the map.